If I should attempt to tell how I have desired to spend my life in years past, it would probably surprise those of my readers who are somewhat acquainted with its actual history. It would certainly astonish those who know nothing about it. I will only hint at some of the enterprises which I have cherished. In any weather, at any hour of the day or night, I have been anxious to improve the nick of time, and notch it on my stick, too. To stand on the meeting of two eternities, the past and future, which is precisely the present moment, to toe that line, you will pardon some obscurities, for there are more secrets in my trade than in most men's, and yet not voluntarily kept, but inseparable from its very nature. I would gladly tell all that I know about it, and never paint no admittance on my gate. I long ago lost a hound, a bay horse, and a turtle dove, and am still on their trail. Many are the travelers I have spoken concerning them, describing their tracks and what calls they answered to. I have met one or two who had heard the hound and the tramp of the horse, and even seen the dove disappear behind a cloud and they seemed as anxious to recover them as if they had lost them themselves. To anticipate, not the sunrise and the dawn merely, but, if possible, nature herself. How many mornings, summer and winter, before yet any neighbor was stirring about his business, have I been about mine? No doubt, many of my townsmen have met me returning from this enterprise, farmers starting for Boston in the twilight, or woodchoppers going to their work, it is true, I never assisted the sun materially in his rising, but, doubt not, it was of the last importance only to be present at it. So many autumn, a and winter days, spent outside the town, trying to hear what was in the wind, to hear and carry it express. I will nigh sunk all my capital in it, and lost my own breath into the bargain, running in the face of it. If it had concerned either of the political parties, depend upon it it would have appeared in the Gazette with the earliest intelligence. At other times, watching from the observatory of some cliff or tree to telegraph any new arrival, or waiting at evening on the hilltops for the sky to fall, that I might catch something, though I never caught much, and that, manna-wise, would dissolve again in the sun. For a long time, I was reporter to a journal, of no very wide circulation, whose editor has never yet seen fit to print the bulk of my contributions, and, as it too common with writers, I got only my labor for my pains. However, in this case, my pains were their own reward. For many years, I was self-appointed inspector of snowstorms and rainstorms, and did my duty faithfully, surveyor, if not of highways, then of forest paths and all across lot routes, keeping them open and ravines bridged and passable at all seasons where the public heel had testified to their utility. I have looked after the wild stock of the town, which gives a faithful herdsman a good deal of trouble by leaping fences, and I have had an eye to the unfrequented nooks and corners of the farm. Though I did not always know whether Jonas or Solomon worked in a particular field today, that was none of my business. I have watered the red huckleberry, the sand cherry, and the nettle tree, the red pine and the black ash, and white grape and the yellow violet, which might have withered else in dry seasons. In short, I went on thus for a long time, I may say it without boasting, faithfully minding my business, till it became more and more evident that my townsmen would not after all admit me into the list of town officers, nor make my place a sinecure with a moderate allowance. My accounts, which I can swear to have kept faithfully, I have, indeed, never got audited, still less accepted, still less paid and settled. However, I have not set my heart on that. Not long since, a strolling Indian went to sell baskets at the house of a well-known lawyer in my neighborhood. Do you wish to buy any baskets? he asked. No, we do not want any, was the reply. What? exclaimed the Indian as he went to the gate. Do you mean to starve us? Having seen his industrious white neighbors so well off, that the lawyer had only to weave arguments, and by some magic, wealth and standing followed. 
he had said to himself, I will go into business, I will weave baskets, it is a thing which I can do, thinking that when he had made the baskets, he would have done his part, and then it would be the white man's to buy them. He had not discovered that it was necessary for him to make it worth the other's while to buy them, or at least make him think that it was so, or to make something else which it would be worth his while to buy. I too had woven a kind of basket of a delicate texture, but I had not made it worth any one's while to buy them. Yet not the less, in my case, did I think it worth my while to weave them, and instead of studying how to make it worth men's while to buy my baskets, I studied rather how to avoid the necessity of selling them. The life which men praise and regard as successful is but one kind. Why should we exaggerate any one kind at the expense of the others? Finding that my fellow citizens were not likely to offer me any room in the courthouse, or any curacy of living anywhere else, but I must shift for myself. I turned my face more exclusively than ever to the woods, where I was better known. I determined to go into business at once, and not wait to acquire the usual capital, using much slender means as I had already got. My purpose in going to Walden Pond was not to live cheaply nor to live dearly there, but to transact some private business with the fewest obstacles, to be hindered from accomplishing which for want of a little common sense, a little enterprise and business talent, appeared not so sad as foolish. I have always endeavored to acquire strict business habits. They are indispensable to every man. If your trade is with the celestial empire, then some small counting house on the coast in some Salem harbor will be fixture enough. You will export such articles as the country affords, purely native products, much ice and pine timber with a little granite, always in native bottoms. These will be good ventures. To oversee all the details yourself in person, to be at once pilot and captain, and owner and underwriter, to buy and sell and keep the accounts, to read every letter received, and write or read every letter sent, to superintend the discharge of imports night and day, to be upon many parts of the coast almost at the same time. Often the richest freight will be discharged upon a Jersey shore, to be your own telegraph, unweariedly sweeping the horizon, speaking all passing vessels bound coastwise, to keep up a steady dispatch of commodities, for the supply of such a distant and exorbitant market. To keep yourself informed of the state of the markets, prospects of war and peace everywhere, and anticipate the tendencies of trade and civilization, taking advantage of the result of all exploring expeditions, using new passages and all improvements in navigation, charts to be studied, the position of reef and new lights and buoys to be ascertained, and ever and ever the logarithmic tables to be corrected. For by the error of some calculator, the vessel often splits upon a rock that should have reached a friendly pier. There is the untold fate of La Perouse, universal science to be kept pace with. Studying the lives of all great discoverers and navigators, great adventurers and merchants, from Hanno and the Phoenicians down to our day, in fine, a count of stock to be taken from time to time, to know how you stand, it is a labor to test the faculties of a man, such problems of profit and loss, of interest, of terror and threat, gauging of all kinds in it, as demand a universal knowledge. I have thought that Walden Pond would be a good place for business, not solely on account of the railroad and the ice trade. It offers advantages which it may not be good policy to divulge. It is a good port and a good foundation. No neva marshes to be filled, though you must everywhere build on piles of your own driving. It is said that a flood tide, with a westerly wind, and ice in the neva, should sweep St. Petersburg from the face of the earth. As this business was to be entered into without the usual capital, it may not be easy to conjecture where those means, that will still be indispensable to every such undertaking, were to be obtained. As for clothing, to come at once to the practical part of the question, perhaps we are led oftener by the love of novelty and a regard for the opinions of men, in procuring it 
than by a true utility. Let me who has work to do recollect that the object of clothing is, first, to retain the vital heat, and secondly, in this state of society, to cover nakedness. And he may judge how much of a neat necessary or important work may be accomplished without adding to his wardrobe. Kings and queens who wear a suit but once, though made by some tailor or dressmaker to their majesties, cannot know the comfort of wearing a suit that fits. They are no better than wooden horses to hang the clean clothes on. Every day our garments become more assimilated to ourselves, receiving the impress of the wearer's character until we hesitate to lay them aside. Without such delay and medical appliances and some such solemnity even as our bodies, no man ever stood the lower in my estimation for having a patch in his clothes, yet I am sure that there is greater anxiety, commonly, to have fashionable, or at least clean and unpatched clothes, than to have a sound conscience. But even if the rent is not mended, perhaps the worst vice betrayed is improvidence. I sometimes try my acquaintances by such tests as this. Who could wear a patch, or two extra seams only, over the knee? Most behave as if they believe that their prospects for life would be ruined if they should do it. It would be easier for them to hobble to town with a broken leg than with a broken pantaloon. Often, if an accident happens to a gentleman's legs, they can be mended. But if a similar accident happens to the legs of his pantaloons, there is no help for it. For he considers, not what is truly respectable, but what is respected. We know but few men, a great many coats and breeches, dress a scarecrow in your last shift, your standing shiftless by, who would not sooner salute the scarecrow. Passing a cornfield the other day, close by a hat and coat on a stake, I recognized the owner of the farm. He was only a little more weather-beaten than when I saw him last. I have heard of a dog that barked at every stranger who approached his master's premises with clothes on, but was easily quieted by a naked thief. It is an interesting question how far men would retain their relative rank if they were divested of their clothes. Could you, in such a state, tell surely of any company of civilized men which belonged to the most respected class? When Madame Pfeiffer, in her adventurous travels around the world, from east to west, I got so near home as Asiatic Russia, she says that she felt the necessity of wearing other than a traveling dress when she went to meet the authorities, for she was now in a civilized country where people are judged of by their clothes. Even in our democratic New England towns, the accidental possession of wealth and its manifestation in dress and equipage alone obtain for the possessor almost universal respect. But they yield such respect, numerous as they are, are so far heathen, and need to have a missionary sent to them. Beside, clothes introduced sewing, a kind of work which you may call endless, a woman's dress, at least, is never done. A man who has at length found something to do will not need to get a new suit to do it in. For him the old will do, that has lain dusty in the garret for an indeterminate period. Old shoes will serve a hero longer than they have served his valet, if a hero ever has a valet. Bare feet are older than shoes, and he can make them do. Only they who go to soirees and legislative halls must have new coats, coats to change as often as the man changes in them. But if my jacket and trousers, my hat and shoes, are fit to worship God in, they will do, will they not? Whoever saw his old clothes, his old coat, actually worn out, resolved into its primitive elements, so that it was not a deed of charity to bestow it on some poor boy, by him perchance to be bestowed on some poorer still, or shall we say richer, who could do with less? I say, beware of all enterprises that require new clothes, and not rather a new wearer of clothes. If there is not a new man, how can the new clothes be made to fit? If you have any enterprise before you, try it in your old clothes. 
All men want not something to do with, but something to do, or rather something to be. Perhaps we should never procure a new suit, however ragged or dirty the old, until we have so conducted, so enterprised or sailed in some way that we feel like new men in the old, and that to retain it would be like keeping new wine in old bottles. Our molting season, like that of the fowls, must be a crisis in our lives. The loon retires to solitary ponds to spend it. Thus also the snake casts its slough, and the caterpillar its wormy coat. By an internal industry and expansion, her clothes are but our outmost cuticle and mortal coil. Otherwise we shall be found sailing under false colors, and be inevitably cashiered at last by our own opinion, as well as that of mankind.